to the cloud. Okay. Ich könnte auch Deutsch machen, aber das würde wahrscheinlich nicht so viel helfen. Ähm. Also. <lacht> okay. Okay, so uh, I hope all your stomachs are full, like our small comic there, and you're ready to <laughs> jump in and learn about Docker and all the other things around it. Yes, so the talk today should be about um, using Docker for a local Drupal development. Um, it is a bit specifically to Drupal, and it's specifically to, to local stuff. So um, <coughs> Docker is much more, and we're going we're gonna to see that too. Um, but today it should be really about how to use Docker correctly on a local hosting environment and that makes your life easier and better and you can code faster and uh, have less hassles in installing stuff. So first of all, uh, Docker. Who has heard of Docker? Okay, who has used it in like, okay, good. Okay, so that's Docker, don't freak out. Um, but Docker is definitely one of the most, also maybe hyped um, thing in the whole sphere of hosting right now. So we have almost every company um, that does anything with hosting does, and it does something with Docker right now. And the reasons are um, a lot of different, um, but we have companies from Red Hat to Microsoft to Google, the obviously big ones to even startups, and Netflix is on there. Um, so we have a lot of companies doing stuff with Docker right now. Um, and it's called also like the, the revolution in how to host and whatever. And what I want to show you today is first how it works and um, why it is cool and how you can use it for the local stuff. So but let's first go a bit back and look at how did we Drupal exist since multiple years? How, what did we do in the past in terms of like um, development location? So obviously the first thing that probably everybody used is like, okay, you actually install an Apache and a PHP on your operating system directly. There are a lot of tools you can either do it by hand, but there's like okay, dev test stuff, there's MAM, LAMP, XAMP, or any other AMPs. And out there that help you like installing it. The problem is first it's very hard to install, especially you cannot install two of them at the same time because they are actually software that is installed in your computer. Um, and you have a lot of dependencies on operation system level. So you cannot use the same stuff on an OSX, even sometimes different OSX versions don't work, different Linux distributions don't work. So these tools have to figure out a lot about like, okay, well, what I'm running on and stuff like that. And um, you can actually not really install multiple versions. So if you need a PHP 5.6 for the Drupal 7 side, and you want to have PHP 7 for the Drupal 8 side, and say you're also doing some Symfony stuff, then you can already use PHP 7.1. There's almost no possibilities. There are some tools that can do that, but overall, it's just a, a big pain, and like updating is very hard. So people thought about that and thought, okay, let's come up with something new. And they came up with something new, um, which was called virtual machines. So we had stuff like Vagrant, we had VirtualBox, VMware does whatever, there's a lot of different things. The problem is that installing and provisioning of the actual VirtualBox, because the virtual machine you usually start is completely empty. And then another tool like Puppet or Ansible or Chef or whatever you use installs additional stuff. But if you just need a new site to test something, you're going to wait half an hour because provisioning just takes time. And um, because you have multiple sites running, that needs a lot of space and also resources. Like each virtual machine runs a whole Linux stack. So like you have a cron system, you have a permission system. If you have five VMs running, that runs five times, plus your own computer. So it runs six times on your whole computer, which is just going to use a lot of resources. And second, it's very hard to build the same systems as in production. So to get like the same PHP version locally installed, or the same um, Nginx, or even Varnish, or Solar, just all these things are already hard. So you need, you need like communicate, you need puppet masters, and whatever. So it's just very complicated. So you obviously guessed it. Docker is a solution for that problem. And um, what is really cool about Docker, um, you don't have any installation per site or container. 
Um, we're going to see that later. So you have images, and if they're done, that's basically it. Um, you use less space and resources, and a lot of them, because what Docker can do, if you run multiple containers, they're going to share. Whatever they can share, they do. And because it's not a full virtual machine, you don't have the problem of like having um, like six permission systems running if you have five sites running. And what is really cool in Docker, what you run locally can be exactly the same like on the production side. And because it doesn't matter where you run it. And so these three things are one of the, are the things that right now in like the hosting sphere, everybody's so excited about. Because these things we could never do in the past. And basically all of three, especially the third one, because now you can run anything anywhere. So let's learn how does Docker work. We're not going to learn how to bake a cake, but um, we're going to learn how Docker works. Um, so this is usually a virtual machine. And the, the contrast is not actually not so good, but we're going to see. So here we have the infrastructure. So that's like your actual hardware. Doesn't matter if that's your computer um, or a server somewhere. And then you have a host operating system, Linux, whatever it is. And then you have a hypervisor which basically allows you to run other operating systems. So each container or each virtual machine will have its own operating system again. And then you have your bins and lips, so that's like Nginx, PHP, Apache, and then you have your app, that's your toolbox. And now you see if we need that multiple times, we have another operating system and you have another operating system. So it just uses a lot of resources to just run three different sites. So what Docker said is, okay, that's not really efficient. That's not really nice. Let's fix that. So that's what Docker is doing. So Docker still has your hardware infrastructure. You still have your host operating system. And instead of the hypervisor, you have a Docker engine. And the Docker engine allows bins and blips, like Nginx, Apache, PHP, and applications directly use parts of the whole operating system. So it is not starting the whole operating system again it in. It's literally just starting the applications in a safe environment of the big one. And that allows to basically all the operating system stuff you don't have. So it's going to be much faster, much better for resources. And what Docker also does, it makes sure that if the, it doesn't matter if the host operating system is now a Linux, a Windows, or a Mac. It makes sure that all the things still work. And that is what the big thing about Docker is. So you can imagine if you are like Facebook and you have probably 50 to 100,000 servers in the whole world, you're very interested to not run something 100,000 times. And Docker, for example, allows them to do that. That's why so many companies are jumping on it, because they can save huge resources. That's one of the reasons there are a lot of others, but that's one. OK, let's go into the main Docker concept, because Docker brings something in that has never existed before. Um, and these are called Docker images. So Docker images are fully provisioned images. That means they have everything included in order to an application, like Drupal or anything else, Node.js or whatever there is, to run. So it's one file that you can move around and you can give to somebody else and what you just copied around are Docker images. So you can give them to somebody else and they can start them and it will run. And it will run exactly the same like it was in my computer. And it doesn't matter if you have different operating systems. And, and what is also very cool, you can build them on top of another image. So your images that you have, there is one point they are the same because like the Nginx is exactly the same installation. Um, you saw there's a PHP 5.6 and PHP 7 uh, version on, on the files. So the difference is actually only the PHP is different. But everything else, the Nginx, the varnish that is also in there, and all locking stuff, Drush, Drupal Console, all these things are exactly the same in both. And when you start an image in Docker, Docker realizes that and does not like use it again. So that means you can create a lot of different, tiny different versions in a very, very fast fashion. Um, that is something that virtual machines never achieved. They tried it for a long time, but they couldn't. So that is a Docker image. And the Docker image you have to create, and you have to share it with each other. And um, 
and you create them by your Docker file. So whenever you see a Docker file somewhere in your life in the future, you know, that is basically, that decides what the Docker image is. So you can take that Docker file and say, build me an image now with that Docker file. Then we have Docker image registries. And as the name says, it provides Docker images. So it's the place to share these Docker images because usually they are created on one single machine, can be your local or can be a build server, doesn't matter. They are put onto a dead registry and then they are distributed. Um, the Docker image registry also understands different layers so if you push something where only, let's say, the, the PHP is different and Nginx is the same, the Docker registry says, okay, no, you don't have to send me that anymore. I will just take the differences. So again, it's going to be much, much faster if you just update the PHP version in one of the Docker images and it's still the same, it doesn't matter. Um, there are a lot of different images. Um, obviously, the, the most common one is hop.docker.io, that is the public one from Docker, but you can also create your private ones. Um, because if you run Docker in production, you're probably going to have code in your Docker images that you don't want to share with everybody. So um, you can create your own registry and that are password protected. Uh, so you don't have to use the public ones all the time. And then we have Docker containers. And Docker containers are built from images. So you take an image, you say, make a container now from that. And the container is actually what runs. So it is like the virtual machine that runs. It's not a virtual machine, but if you're trying to search like analogy, it is what actually runs on your computer that does run PHP and Nginx or And they can also mount external files. So I said before, everything is going to be in the, in the image. It, that is also going to be in the container. But let's say you want to have something else, um, like our PHP code that we later going to use, um, they can be mounted in there. So um, it's not NFS, it's something internally in Docker, um, but you can use it. Yes, so let's see how the whole thing works. So first we need an image, and the image is built by Docker files, you do that locally, and then you push them to a registry. Uh, with the, while the pushing, the registry tells you which of the layers it actually needs or not. And, and then you pull the images from the registry and the Docker container is created from that image. And if you have the image, image locally running, you can create as many containers as you want without actually needing to connect to the registry again. And so that's very cool for a local hosting environment because everybody of us works on multiple sites. So we only have to download the image once, and then we can run the containers. We can, run, we can start 10 containers from that single image, and um, they are completely independent. OK, sounds good. But OK, why do we need that? I'm already having Nokia Dev desktop running, or I'm having, I don't know, some virtual machine system running. So why do we need Docker? Why is everybody so excited? So the first reason is that the provisioning, the stuff that takes like installing mentioning, installing an Apache is happening before. You can do that once and then you can start containers and they are there instantly. Within seconds, you have a whole new, a whole new computer, if you want, running. That is something that never existed before. Virtual machines had like snapshots, but even the snapshots were not as fast as, Drupal, as Docker containers now then also everything you need is inside one single image. You don't have any dependencies around it. You pull down an image and you run it. Like I needed, three days ago, I needed an, a RabbitMQ. So you just say Docker pull RabbitMQ, Docker run RabbitMQ, and you have a whole RabbitMQ running. You don't have to install anything at all, you have that. If you want to run a node server, you download it done. If you want to have a PHP, you download it done. You don't have to install anything at all besides of just getting the image done. And then the third one is Docker makes sure that whatever you have in that image runs everywhere. So it runs on your notebook, it runs on your, um, on your production server, it runs at Rackspace, it runs at Amazon, it runs at DigitalOcean. It doesn't matter because Docker is making sure that everything works. So, Again, that sounds very cool. So why do we need Docker for the local de development? First of all, you don't have to wait anymore to provision your virtual machines. 
like if you started, like if you run Baker Dev up and you went and got at least three coffees and came back or even had lunch because it took an hour. So sorry, that's going to be over with Docker. Um, because the provisioning already happens before. Um, then second, everything is already there. You don't have to install Trush, you don't have to install console, you don't have to, you have to install Varnish on Solar. Everything is going to be in that image that you need. You only need to install Docker on your computer, and that's it. Nothing else. And it runs on Linux, Mac, and Windows, and whatever other maybe operating system is out there. And as long as, you can, as, as long as it's supported by Docker, you can run it. So if you ever try to install Varnish on a Windows, for example, that's never going to work. But if you run it inside the Docker container on Windows, then you can run it. OK, let's start. Um, so how to use it? You can either build the images yourself, or you can use existing Docker images. If you want to build them yourself, well, you need some knowledge about hosting, and also you need some knowledge about Docker. If you have that, awesome, great, you can do that. Um, but probably not a lot of people actually do that because they know a lot of other awesome things in the lab. So um, let's go to the second version. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to use existing Docker images. Um, so if you search Drupal Docker images, the most probably the first result that you will <laughs> see is the Docker Hub Drupal. Do not use that. It's not made for local development environments. It looks like it, and it looks very cool. Unfortunately, that is not what the purpose is for. I'm one of them that tries to get rid of that thing, or at least write it somewhere that um, you should not use that for local development environments. But well, there are, though, a lot of other tools that use that are either completely built on Drupal uh, on Docker or partially used. Docker, like for example, Qualabox uses partially Docker, um, but there are Druids, there is a Drupal Docker on GitHub. If you want to try them out, the slides are online later on, and you can give them, or you can use what we have. So Amazia.io, which is a hosting company, we said, hey, we want to provide the whole Drupal community very good local hosting environments. So we give them out for free. Um, and why do we do that? First of all, you have all services in one. And if you talk about Docker in production, that's not the way to do it. But running locally on all servers in one makes a lot of sense. So we have PHP, we have Nginx, we have Varnish, we have Solar, we have Drush, we have Composer, we have Drupal Console, we have Xdebug, we have Blackfire. And that's only half of this. So all these things you're just going to have on your computer installed without ever worrying of installing them because you just saw the container based on memory. Secondly, we will fully maintain and support it um, because that's what we use every day. And so um, we're going to make sure that like PHP 7.1 comes soon. So we're going to have an image for PHP 7.1. And um, we are working on updating Solar and like all these things. So we're going to continue maintaining. Um, you can have custom engineers and Solar configurations, especially Solar configurations. are usually think that uh, if you build multilingual sites or very fixed sites, and um, the whole configuration of everything, so for PHP and Nginx, everything is built for Drupal. It can run other stuff, it's not built for it. And um, so everything like from PHP opcode configuration <coughs> or stuff like that, that you maybe learn at one point that this is not going to make your Drupal site faster. And um, all of that, all our knowledge of seven years Drupal hosting is in that image, and you can just use it. <laughs> And the last thing we're just going to see, we have nice URLs. So usually within Docker, you have a lot of different ports, and it's very hard to use. And um, with our system, we actually have very nice URLs. And we have some helpful tools that we also going to install today that make it just a bit easier. Because uh, especially for all your Macs out there, and um, Docker <coughs> needs like, some additional things to actually run. But we all package them in nice and helpful tools so you can install. And um, all of that I'm going to show you today. So if you don't have your notebook with here, uh, no problem. It's all on docs.amazia.io. It's all there. But we're going to go through it step by step now. I'm going to show it to you. You can do it at the same time. And um, it's also recorded. So if you have any questions or whatever, you want to watch the video again, um, there you are. Yeah, let's do that. OK. So the first thing we want to go is uh, check the internet. 
um, and hopefully it's not going to die immediately. So if you open your browser and go to docs.amazy.io, and you're all going to tell me if that thing actually loads or not, if it looks like that, it has loaded. All good? Everybody connected to the internet? Okay, cool. Um, okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to install the local Drupal Docker development. And um, it consists of multiple parts and we're going to go through it. We're going to use the second one, the Linux and the OSX. There is one specifically for OSX. We're going to use the one that runs for Linux and OSX. So you can click on that here. And we can see the whole thing. The tool is called Pygmy. Pygmy is a small sperm whale. What a surprise in terms of Docker. Um, so we have, um, we have our name here as well. So um, the first thing you want to do, if you are on a Mac in the files that you copied before, there is a file called docker.dmg. So you're going to double click it and it's going to open and you do what the world tells you. Um, you drag it into applications and that is that. If you are anybody on Windows, who? No? Yes? Okay. <laughs> no, don't make an example out of that. <laughs> there is a documentation for it. So if you go on the left side on Windows, just follow that thing. It's a bit complicated, but I can, I can definitely help you later on getting it running. It runs, it works, we have it running. It's a bit complicated. If you are on Linux, anybody Linux? Wow, interesting. Okay, if you would be on Linux, you just enter Linux Docker and you follow whatever that tells you. Um, so it, there is a lot of different ways on how to install it. Um, depending on, where is it here? Um, depending on your operating system, um, but all of them are covered here. So um, yes. Okay, let's go back. Um, so we dragged it or it into the applications folder and now in here there is a, a small the whale with docker.app We double click that and it's gonna open the first time and Yes, we want to do that. That's okay They are very happy. That's very good. We need to give it some permissions. Okay, and it should start and you will see on top here. There is now also a whale visible there and um, that is only a question for me because I installed it before. If you also see that, just click no. And it will tell you that it's starting and at one point it will be done. So we're gonna wait that everybody is at that point. We've got like a Docker on the status bar, but I've also got this message that says fatal. Oh, wow. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's just not working. So it is there. It is there. Okay. I have other Can you stop then? Oh, it's just up. Well, every time I want it. Okay, that's here. It's called Michael's 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 Okay, so everybody has that running since that? Up and running? Good, although easier than you thought. Okay. So with that, we have Docker running. We can verify that if we open a terminal and just run Docker info, and we should see some blah. And so if you just open on the terminal, run Docker info, you can see like, okay, we have zero container. Docker info. <laughs> Good. 
installed. You have Docker installed. It wasn't that hard, right? Okay. Um, cool. Okay, so it has come in up around. Oh, Docker space in here. Mm -hmm. Good job. Okay. So this is what you need in order to just run Docker. Now, what um, what Amazing IO does is usually if you run Docker, um, if you run multiple containers, you will end up with multiple um, ports because each container or one container can maximum use port 80. So what happens inside of Docker, it will just put the first container on maybe something port 3000 something and the second one another. That's very hard to maintain and you never know like, okay, which one is now running on which on port. And so what we did is um, we um, built a small tool called PickMe, which will install an additional Docker container that will make it easier for you to handle um, containers running at this, uh, which makes it much easier for like handling because remembering a It's not going to die. Any errors? Okay, can you add a sudo in front? Mine doesn't want to work. Hey Michael, is, is Pygmy just proxying okay. over to the different ports from the incoming request or how? It's starting an HA proxy, which does the proxy. Okay, everybody has that installed? Cool. Okay, so what you're gonna do now is just call, so if you go back to the documentation, uh, what it tells is run Pygmy up. So we're gonna run that. And so that could, so that also downloads something um, and it's gonna take a bit. So if it doesn't finish within like five or 10 seconds, you can just stop it with control C. And then um, in, the, in the Docker folder or the, what you copied from your USB stick, there's a folder called amazio-haproxy. You double click that and there is a file in there called load image command. And if you double click that, it will open a terminal. And so what, I, what we actually did is instead of downloading it from the internet and the, di and, uh, the whole dying stuff, you have it in there already. And it will just run through a bit and it will tell you at the end loaded image. So that is the way of distributing images locally instead of like downloading them from the internet. If you're at home and having and are not like 30 notebooks trying to squeeze through one internet connection, and you will never use that again. But that is the easy. You seem to be looking for it on your local system. Correct. Because it was winding its way around. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it actually tells, yeah, it doesn't find it. And so you will install it with that. So everybody done that? So if you go back and just run pick me up again, 
um, it, you see already that it now mine tells successfully started because it found the image now. It has that? I'm actually stuck on this. When we come back to it later, I think I had trouble before trying to do it. Do you, ah, you have cache log installed. Okay, so um, you added something to the bash profile? Probably. Yes, so let's just remove admin. You can add it later on, or you can just remove that forever. And okay, now, now it works. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. So my second Okay, that's yes. that's a good question. Does it support HTTPS? Do you have like yes. a wildcard cert on the that way you second the maze I over me? Yeah. And um, do you have a man or anything else running? Can you stop it? No. So, Okay, so while you're running pick me up, it will ask you for your password. Um, and the reason is that, um, so what we do is uh, we inject an, an, a loopback IP address into your, uh, or an IP address into your loopback interface. If you're interested in why we do that, I can explain you, it's a Docker issue. Um, but it basically just needs your, your Mac password. So I'm gonna enter that here. And also, it's also going to ask for your passphrase of your SSH key. So inside the Docker container later on, we want to have our SSH key for stuff like the push and get pull. And in order to not every time that we start the container have to enter the passphrase, we are using an other container that has an SSH agent running and blah, blah, blah. So it's a bit complicated, but it's quite cool. So it just asks you once. For your um, for your SSH key, most probably you don't have a passphrase for your SSH key, then you just run through it. But if you have one, you can just enter it. So it should end up looking like that. And if we run Docker PS now, we can see that we have three containers running now. So everybody should be here. Nope. No, no, I, I do have not par. What's that? Well, it's a. <laughs> <laughs> can you stop it? Yeah. Okay, can you just try to stop it and we'll see? Is it a So you're saying. Uh, 
But it's somehow still runs. Yeah, it is here. Brandon, you want to fix the thing? Yep. Fix <laughs> <laughs> so, the thing. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow on his local boat, he does an extra or some website or whatever. Throw away by him. <laughs> <laughs> you always say that. <laughs> I don't a lot. Okay, everybody else, it works? No? A quick question on the SSH agent. Yes. How are you passing that SSH agent through to the other machine? I'll show you what the fuck is. And we're we're not using the virtual box. <laughs> we're not installing the virtual box to run Docker on. No, nope. because the Docker for Mac uh -huh. uses its own hypervisor that is provided by the website. Okay, that's a new thing, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, out. Yeah. The backlog exists in top of the year, and they call it stable as it's coming. And you don't need the virtual box to do this. As long as you ignore the change notice every two weeks, that's, that may consume like 100% of the CPU. <laughs> that's probably, I think that's what my problem I, I did Docker, Docker OS X native beta. Yes, well, but it should. <clears throat> so, yeah, okay. I'm still trying to get that. Good. So, um, yes, so we have that running. If you now go to docker.amazio.stats, if you open that, a website with HA proxy version, something, something should come up. That is the case, you did everything correct. Yes, can you just run pick me up again? Okay. Because you had cash up before installed, so that sometimes doesn't like each other. Okay, try again. Can you restart? I have the DNS mask already. So. Yeah, it shouldn't matter. Okay, it said it was doing something to it. Yeah, I can. I can just, everybody sees that? If somebody yeah, not? Did it? Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's oh, much, it? it's much bigger. So, <laughs> right. It looks like that. Something like that. <laughs> okay. Um, it still needs me, but you can, you can keep going. Let's take it. Yeah. Okay, yeah, let's look like at that later. Sounds good, thanks. Okay, so let's go back to our little help. Um, so what we have done now is basically the part one. So we have now Docker installed and we have Pigment installed and um, looking at that shows us that the URL docker.amazy.io which is actually not any, that's running locally on your computer. So every site that you have running locally is gonna be called via docker.amazy.io. And now we're gonna do the part two and this is the Drupal Docker containers. So the idea is that for every site that you have, so for every Drupal site, 
you can create your own Drupal container. So it's not like virtual and um, like a MAM or something where you just like add another line to a configuration or something. You actually start a full container for each site. But because these containers are sharing resources, having running multiple of them is not a problem at all. So in order to do that, usually in Docker, you run huge lines of Docker run. So there's a command line Docker run, and then you have to pass it like 50 different parameters, which um, is quite hard to do. Um, on the other side, we have a tool called Docker Compose. Um, so Docker Compose basically reads the configuration from a YAML file and um, will run it. So these YAML files, you can see if you go to docs.mizio, on the left side, click on Drupal Docker containers. There is a link in under find the right Docker Compose YAML to visit docker.mizio. And here you can see there are different um, YAML files already existing. So we provide the YAML files for you and you don't have to write them yourself. And now you basically choose which version you would like to use. And there are two main differences. The first of all is between PHP 5.6 and PHP 7. So if you have Drupal 7, um, if you wanna run a Drupal 7 site inside your Docker container, you use that. If you have a Drupal 8, you can use PHP 7.0. Um, in our case, we're going to use the basic and not the solar. If you want to run solar, I also have the images on here, and there are slightly different images, but we can also try that. And then it also depends. Um, if you look in your, um, like, some like the, the old way of installing Drupal was within directly um, a Git repository. So you have, like, I have here my um, website, amazebuild.io, and in there, I directly have my index.php, like here. But if you use the newest version with um, Drupal 8.02 with like the um, composer and stuff, what's gonna happen is now I have to find one. What's gonna happen is that in your main repository, you do not have an index.php, but you have a web folder. And in that web folder, is your Drupal, but that's because of the whole composer stuff. Most probably you don't have that yet, maybe you do, but anyway, so you choose basically on that. In our case, 99% currently it is just PHP 7.0 basic. If you already use composer, use PHP 7.0 composer. If not, just use the PHP 7 basic. So the idea is that you, you see that file and that defines what Docker should do exactly. And the file has a lot of different things. First of all, it tells the host name. So that is the host name that you later on gonna visit your website with. Um, it is gonna enable APC support, which makes your Drupal site much faster. Um, and then it's also gonna tell like which images and it goes to some volumes and some SSH things and stuff like that. But um, you don't have to worry about any of that stuff. The only thing we really gonna need is actually change that URL. So what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna take a completely fresh Drupal 8 from Drupal.org. So I go to Drupal.org and I'm gonna download my Drupal. I hope that's gonna work. And you can do that either also download a completely new fresh Drupal or you can do your existing Drupal site. It doesn't matter anymore. From now you can do, um, you can run, you can do that steps for every of your Drupal sites and you can just use them. But I'm gonna use a completely fresh one so we can see how that works. There's not a fresh Drupal site in a container? No, there's no Drupal site inside the container. And the idea is specifically that you can run it for every of your Drupal sites. Um, okay, so I downloaded Drupal 8 here. And um, 
the idea is for your development environment to run both your Drupal and your Drupal files. Yeah. Correct. So I downloaded my Drupal and I see, oh, I have an index of PHP directly. Great. So, um, so what I do, what I want to do now is I want like the, um, so the documentation says, copy the desired example file into your Drupal directory and pick basic file if unsure, that's what I did, and rename the file to Docker Compose YAML. So I'm going to go here and I can, for example, I can download the whole thing. I just download the whole zip file from GitHub. And I have my, hold on. So I have my Drupal 8 here and I have my Docker here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna copy that file, the example PHP 7.0 basic over here and rename it to docker-compose YAML. And now, uh, if we go back to the, to the specification, it also says, oh, sorry, edit the file according to your needs, change at least the host name. So um, we're gonna do that, so I'm gonna open that. And we see that is the file that we saw from GitHub before, and I just call that Drupal 8. And as mentioned correctly before, the Docker automated delivery has to stay there because if you do that, our um, the images or the, the containers that are already running, they are looking for sites that have that running. So you can do whatever you want in front, and you can also have subdomains, as many as you want. Um, but the the main thing has to be Docker automated again. All the other stuff we don't have to change. So that's it. So we have my Docker Compose YAML file there. And what the documentation says now is run Docker Compose up dash D. What that does is it will download the image. So like before we saw that the image actually does not exist. So it will try to download. And as the image is quite big because it contains a lot of things, it will take a lot of time. So before we do that here, we go back to our folder that we created before. And you see in here, you, are, you have the five, six basic and the seven basic. I also have two solars, that's okay. But I'm gonna take the seven zero basic because that is also what is, sorry, what is written here. So I wanna use the same version and I just double click it. And that is like before, also gonna import that Docker image into my Docker environment um, and it does not, or it will not download it. So it, that, that's gonna be much faster. That's gonna take two or three minutes to do all that because I said it's quite big, um, yes. So that process of um, taking your Docker Compose YAML file, if you work in an environment with multiple developers, it's perfectly fine to commit that file into like your Git repository. Because another person that also wants to use that site, they don't have to create that file anymore. And it's already there. So the idea is that if somebody um, says, okay, hey, I'm gonna help you on your site, they just download the site and run Docker Compose up dash D, that's it, and it runs everything. So that's like the process. One person has to do that for each Drupal site, and then others can just reuse it. Okay, and here we actually see how also the different layers. So the image consists of different layers. So, yes, sorry, I can show you that. So you open, you go to your folder, Go to PHP 7.0 basic, yeah. and there is a dot command, and you're gonna use that. Oh, the document? Yes, that imports the image. The PHP 7.0 basic. Oh, 
But it's going to be even cooler, but we'll see. OK, so the import is being done. So that means that image now exists in our Docker environment. And um, we don't have to do anything anymore. And now we can actually run docker-compose-up-d. So that is like the process that somebody of your team is doing all the time. So I'm going to into my site, and this is called Drupal 8.1.10. And if I see here, there is my Docker Compose ML file that I created before, and I just run, oh, sorry. I just run Docker Compose up dash D. And it will create me my container. And the creating just already happened. So that two, three seconds that it takes is actually the time that it takes to start the container. The image download is going to take a bit. But after that, I can start and stop container as I want. And that's the real speed of Docker. So if I run Docker PS, I can see now it's a bit big. Let me make it smaller. If I run Docker PS, I can see now there is an image running Drupal 8.docker.amazing.io. So that is my container. And I can now open that in my browser, and it will throw an error message at me. But that error message is good, because it basically tells there's no Drupal installed. Um, or, well, in that case, it will actually try to install. Um, so I can either do that, or um, the other thing is, so usually um, you need to know the database credentials and stuff like that. What we did, if you follow um, the, the documentation, you can see here that there is an, a way to connect to the container. So if you copy that and run that in here, what it does, it connects like via SSH. It's not SSH, but it connects into the container. And I'm going to move it a bit up so we can see that. So I'm now inside my whale. So there's a small whale in front of it. And um, that tells you you are <laughs> still the same. <laughs> you, you are, which one do you use for production? Uh, we, we have a random one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that tells you you are inside the container. Because sometimes it's like, uh, who, where am I? And so that, and then it tells Drupal at Drupal 8.docker.io. So you also know all the time in which container I am I right now. And it tells we are in public HTML. So that is now all the commands you're running now is running inside your um, site. So now if I run Rush, Rush is already going to be there. Um, and if we look, if we run, um, at, for the ones that use that know Linux a bit better, you can see what is all running, and you see there's a PHP FVM, there's a PHP FVM with X debug, so you can step debug out of the box, and we have Blackfire, we have Varnish, we have Nginx, we have MySQL, <laughs> everything is already running, and um, and it's literally just a matter of seconds of sorting something. So you have two different PHP FVM processes, you get the speed from yes. the bottom and the debug. Yes, and Nginx chooses which one. It's all there. <laughs> Um, nope, it, um, it <laughs> checks if there is a cookie set or not. There's different ways. So, but that means you are actually inside your Drupal. Um, if I want to install now, if I run Drush SI, um, it does, uh, like I don't have any database credentials. And usually, 
um, you could now take these credentials and like you know them and in our case they're called the username is Drupal, the password is Drupal, but I have to remember things. So that's not very cool. So what we actually are doing is um, if we go here, and I'm going to make it a bit bigger. So what the MCIO specifically does, we, we expose so-called environment variables. Because you don't want usernames or passwords in your Drupal settings file. Please do not put any passwords or usernames in there. Because if you push them to GitHub and you make that environment public at one point, because you thought it's a good idea, everybody will have access to your password. So what we do instead is the Docker container as well, also all our production sites, they do they expose so-called environment variables. And Drupal or the PHP in Drupal can access them. And so what we actually do on production sites, we change them once a week. Your production database password is going to change once a week, specifically for the idea that you never come to the idea to save your password anywhere because it should not be saved. So if anybody's going to steal your password, they have max access to one week to your production site. Um, and so if you look, if you know a bit how the Drupal settings files are looked, they, it is like a Drupal settings file, all that stuff. And just follow tells like where is the database, the username, the password, the host port. And uh, we also tell it the base URL. So Drupal actually knows what um, the URL is. So all you have to do is to not make it too big because then you cannot copy it anymore. You copy that. And we're going to go to your Drupal 8. And we go to sites default. And we have the default settings of PHP. And you probably know that step. You copy that. Call it settings of PHP. That's all. That's what we all know. And then instead of like copying that and whatever, um, all you do, you go at the end and just paste that in. And that works side by side with Okia, Pantheon, or anything else. So you can have that in there, even though you maybe have MAMP or whatever. Because what it actually does, it checks first if you are inside an amazing environment. If you're not, none of that stuff is going to be filled out. So you can run that at the same time with Pantheon or whatever else you want to use it. So that's all you have to do. You put it in there, you save it. And now, um, when I run draft site install, now it will know that my Drupal site is actually called Drupal. And I can install it there. And that's going to take a second or two. And it will install my Drupal site inside there. And this is like best practices to not have any passwords. Because that file, that settings of PHP file, I can give to anybody they will not have access to anything at all. Um, and so that makes it much easier to like share files and handle a lot of different things. Um, if you are more interested about environment variables, there is actually a whole, uh, a whole page on our docs that, sorry, that explains you all the different environment variables. I mean, even cool stuff like if you ever had issues with your hair salt, you're generating one for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Um, there's like connection to the varnish, there's a pen pad. There's all these things that you usually need, like specifically to the hosting environment, are there, and you can use them. You use a Drush aliases with this, like do you have to be SSH or whatever the equivalent is for Docker and use Drush? Um, so you mean to use it outside yeah, with Drush like, aliases? Yeah, exactly. So there are people that um, actually hijack the Drush command to say if they run Drush, it runs inside the container if, even if you're not connected to the container. Okay. So that would be the way to do it. Um, you just have to hijack your Drush command, which is a bit complicated if you're not used to this. But if you want to use it, I think it's somewhere in here. Okay. 
Yes. Yes. I, I mean, yeah, theoretically, you don't have to install Drush anymore in your OSI. Yeah. That, that assumes you're running Docker all the way through like Drush and then every environment. Uh, no. Oh, you have to SSH into every environment. Or you can just SSH into the proxy and you can do it. And drop it at the bottom, correct. Okay, so my site is installed. Um, now I can go back to my um, URL and I can open it and it should load me a whole football site completely fresh <laughs> installed. It's going to take a bit the first time because of um, caches. Oh, here we are. So I have a full Drupal 8 site installed. Um, yes. Um, um, let me check. Yeah, it feels a bit slow, to be honest. Usually it's not that slow, especially a completely fresh installation. Well, it gets there. Yeah, it is enabled. Yeah, so the one that you want to know is the max memory consumption. It's per default, it's, per, it's like 16 or so. So yes, so this is basically the whole thing. And now if I want to get rid of it, or if I want to um, stop it, um, I can see that if I run Docker PS, I can see that my container is still running. What I can run is Docker compose down and it stops my container and it's also gonna throw it away. So the database that I just installed is also gonna be gone. So it says removing. And if I go back here, there is, it will time out. So there's nothing, no site there. So what I can do, I can just run um, Docker compose up again and it creates me again. And I can connect now. 
and I will have a completely fresh site that throws an error on me now. So that's literally like stopping and starting a container is that fast. Um, and I don't have to like wait or whatever because all the Docker is running, I have the image locally, and it's gonna be very fast in starting and stopping. And I can also do that at the same time. So let me, if I connect into that and I just run it on a draft site install, and at the same time, I'm gonna go to like my MACIO site. And in there, there is also Docker Compose because um, the site is also built. So I can just run Docker Compose up dash E in here and it creates me an MACIO Docker. And that's done too. So now I have two containers running at the same time. Um, so I can also connect into that. And you can see now I have one running that is called an ACIO Docker and I have another running that's called Docker. So I can have multiple sites running at the same time. And I don't have to worry about ports or anything like that because the URL is actually the figuring out which site is does it work well for like, uh, like debugging in PHP Storm? Yes. So debugging. There is a documentation that tells you what to do. It's over here. Um, that shows you how to do it, but I can show it to you here. So what I want to do is you want to first open the the environment that you actually want to step debug. In my case, um, or let me open the, I mean, the, the other one. So I say open directory and I go to my, I have to wait a bit. So what you need is um, we basically just follow the PHP documentation. So what you need is these um, debugging cookies. So if you go, there's a link to the PHP Storm documentation. And on here, it explains you what you should do. So the first thing we have to do is um, enable connections from the outside. Uh, it's not done yet, sorry. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. I can do the other things first. So um, I have to click that, then I have to set a breakpoint or it will not work. Then, um, yeah, so there is to activate it, we have to add these um, booklets to my browser. It's the same, and um, that is just specifically for, yes, yeah, correct. Um, yeah, I think both of them should actually work. I never tried the other one, but at the end, it's doing the exact same. That is just specifically from PHP Storm, but it doesn't matter. So you go to your Drupal, um, where is it? My Drupal site here, and I'm gonna just check that the site actually works. It's still installing. Hmm, that's an interesting group, though. Anyway, I want to step debug that. Okay, so I go here and I click on the um, opening connections. And you go here and click on start debugger. What that thing does, it creates um, in my cookies, it creates me a cookie with xdebug session PHP storm. And that's what we actually are looking for. So if I refresh now, my PHP storm will tell me, hey, there's an incoming connection. And I say, okay, I want to do that. Now I didn't create the breakpoint. <clears throat> but I'd say I create a breakpoint here. What do you mean? The same session name that 
PHP Storm. Yeah, that's why PHP Storm did them. And I'm debugging. So uh, I can see now my cookies. I can see my server. I can step debug through it. I will see everything here. So the only thing you really have to do is um, after you have installed that thing, you click that once. You go to PHP Storm and you click that. Done. There's nothing else you have to do. Um, because so what the container does, the X debug inside tries to connect outside and hits PHP Storm and PHP Storm will say, okay, yes, and you can go through it. And yeah. So it's all documented here. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, so our suggestion is to use, um, they are, if you go to the MESI.io, there is a Drupal settings files, and you don't have to use them, but what we suggest is to use is, um, is a settings of PHP that is included all the time, and all settings of PHP is also included all the time. And then you have the production settings and the production the development settings, and you also have the services. And so what happens is that on um, the settings PHP, I'll make it a bit big. Oh, it seems too big. So what we're doing, we have an environment variable that is exposed, depends on where you are, even if you're on production or on development. No, that's actually on the production side. But also, yes, yes. So if we go here and I run env, we can see that oh, export is easier. Yes, so these are all the environment variables and one of them is called the Amazio location, which is called Docker. And with that, I know, yes. <laughs> Um, and so, yeah, so we load different settings and services YAMLs. And if you look at them on development services, I just completely disabled them. Well, it depends on, so we actually ended up using that to have like another settings.local that actually really uses that because not everybody needs to completely disable the cache. So it's a bit developer's discretion how to use that. Yes. Yeah, so yeah. Correct. Yes. So the development yeah. services YAML just says that tweak debug is true, auto reload is true, and cache is false. But it will still cache the result of tweak. Twig itself, the cache is disabled, but there's another, there's a render cache that you have to disable as well, which is what you do here. So, yeah, you will find them all online. So. Okay, did it work for the people that followed? Yes? Oh no. <laughs> It's loading. Yeah. So yes, um, usually what you did is just a site install. And um, there is obviously, you maybe want to have an existing, like you have an existing um, DB dump or something. And um, there is actually another documentation that is called get your Drupal site locally running, which again explains everything you have to do. And it ex and explains you how to add an existing database, and it's actually super easy. Um, all you do, you just run at Rush as for connect, and you get your dump in there. All the things, and then you have it inside your container. But where do you usually keep the, the dump? Would that be on your, your local machine, or that would you be familiar with that? So what we use, we, we synchronize it with our dev sites. Okay. So if I start the site, I will just synchronize it down by the brush. Um, 
Yeah. So if you actually if you have the SQL files, it'll be it's not NFS, it's OXS, FS, and it's extremely slow on this thing, but it'll still be available in there inside of where all the rest of you are from. So like most of what is set in that like the site stretch or whatever it is, pull it in there. Um, once you once you jump into the container that has the structure. Yes. So if you actually um if the site is also running on a Mesi IO, um, it means our production or development environment, um, you can actually just run Drush SA and it will show you all site aliases as like all other sites that we have. So I have like at dev. So what I can do now is say SQL sync at dev default and it will connect to the dev site and make a DB dump imported locally and done. And I can do that for each of the sites that I have. So I can do that for prod, I can do that for dev. Um, so yeah, I don't have to like keep the dumps actually with me around, um, which is just much, much easier and nicer. Yeah. And with that, I can also like connect. So um, if I go here, Another cool thing I can also say Josh at dev SSH and I will connect to the dev site and um, without actually like needing to know when it's going to authenticate via SSH. So you can see on the dev site we have a hammer because it's a development site. And if you go to the production site, what do you think? Mm. Ah, it's not, it doesn't want to, doesn't want to play. Okay, no installing. Everything, everything, everything. Mm -hmm. Ha, seems the servers are already asleep. There we are. So it's a production house. Mm -hmm. And it's red. And it li I, I literally saved myself of like running like drush site install on, on the production side. So, um, so yeah, so what we do is like local is all green, development is blue, and production is like red. Um, yeah. How yes. Um, via our API. On the back side? Yeah. Yeah. With Josh. Correct. Yes. Correct. Yes. It's GraphQL. But Ooh. so, yeah. So there is, um, there is a small alias of Josh RCPHP, which um, downloads a bigger one and that connects to the API and downloads. Um, and there is an, there's in the MCIO, there is tells you which site group it is. And with that, it's yeah, kind of yeah, checked yeah. and knows which sites that there exist and stuff like that. So. Cool. I know it was a lot. Um, as I said, it is all documented here if you want to go through it. And um, also, if you have any questions and if you, if you really want to use it and it doesn't work, we have another Slack channel. Um, <laughs> that um, is completely free to use. You'll find it on slack.amazy.io and you can join there and we're happy to help because as I said, um, I think the Drupal community suffered way long enough to not have cool and fast and really usable local hosting environments. So um, we want to push that so we give free support if you have any problems. Um, it is our Slack. There is a Docker channel as well where people help each other and setting it up and even running in crazy environments and stuff like that. So just join there and come and ask. Um, yeah, that's it. And if you have more questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you. There's pizza left. <laughs> okay. Are we going to fix it? Yeah. So you can hang around for a little bit, ask questions. Like you said, there's actually so, pizza. Reminder the Drupal Dojo is tomorrow night. If you want to work on some of the stuff, we're on the pizza. But seven. this is my yeah, it's going to ask you for it.
Okay, so the question is, did it work when I was in here? The other thing. The question is how, because the container is still running. Like usually, if you if you start it, it tells you, you know, it tries to bind on port fifty three. It should not work. If the DNS mask is already running. Yeah, I've tried that already. Yeah, it's like I have to speak to you. I'm sure it's a little bit of a short game. I just set it up so that it points everything or any of the dev aid or dev. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, at the end, that's exactly what I'm doing. Yeah. So I'm not doing anything else. So what we could do... In the resolver directory, there's also an entry for that. Yeah. I think they're good. It would just attempt to resolve via those, but not running the service. I've never seen somebody setting up its own DNS mask. That's, that's quite cool. Uh, it's, it's, the it's the height of desperation of not wanting to plug in for another yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I, yeah. Having so then I've got a virtual host where I can just. Oh no no no! It's great. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great solution. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah, you know, one, so How are you live streaming that? Uh, when you're running the new. Uh, when you're running the new containers that are coming out. Yes. Yeah. How are they registering themselves? With, uh, the HA proxy listens to the Docker stuff. I can show you. Well, yeah. How do you restart? I have no idea. It's <laughs> probably a service DNS restart. I don't know. Yeah. 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 Okay, three stars then. Oh, wait. Okay, so now. <laughs> Yeah. So I basically just added it to it. Okay, let me stop. Michael, this is 